good evening. Thank you for joining us. Today we're thrilled to be able to talk to Professor Erin Leithart, a leading figure in political science. For over 50 years, Professor Leithart has been studying how democracies work and how groups and divided societies can govern together. His seminal publication, Patterns of Democracy, and his writings on consensus democracy and political systems have not only influenced students and scholars for decades, but have also shaped politics and policies around the world. Today, we have the chance to hear from Professor Leipart about his thoughts on democracy, the challenges it faces today, and what the future might hold. My name is Tara. And I'm Sean. Please give a warm welcome to Professor Aaron Leipart, joining us online in sunny Southern California. So Professor Leipart, I think you can hear, hopefully you can hear some of the claps in the background. There is an audience here that's very excited to hear from you. Um, so thank you for joining us again. Uh, you have focused on democracies and political divisions throughout your long research career. Were there any early events in your life that shaped how you view democracy? Yes, uh, let me uh, just correct you one thing. Uh, I am not in Southern California, I am in Northern California, and I'm sitting here at, in my study in San Francisco. Uh, yes, uh, I, th I think uh, uh, you asked me that uh, question on uh, in an email before, and I've thought about that, and I've actually tried to answer that question uh, before when people have, have asked me. I think probably the greatest influence on 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 me and why I chose the the, the path uh, that uh, I have taken uh, were my my parents. Uh, my my father was a, a local politician in the small town uh, where I grew up, which is called Heerde on the Veluwe. Uh, uh, I was born in Apeldoorn on the Veluwe, but grew up in uh, grew up in Heerde. Uh, I lived in a small, small town. My father was a member of the uh, town council uh, and uh, was very active in all kinds of uh, voluntary or organizations in, uh, in Heerde. Uh, and so that is one, one aspect. Uh, my, my mother all, also in, influenced me. She was very internationally uh, oriented. She has a, a, a very interesting background. She was born in Paramaribo in Suriname. Uh, and then as a, a very young girl, she moved with her parents to uh, Zurich in Switzerland, uh, where my grandfather got his uh, PhD in, in biology. And then uh, when she was not even seven years old, the whole family moved to what was then the, the Netherlands East Indies, specifically Java, which is now now in Indonesia. Uh, so as a matter of fact, before uh, she was even seven years old, uh, she had already lived on three different uh, three different continents. And then it continued when she was of the age to go to uh, uh, secondary school or high school. Uh, she went to, to Geneva in Switzerland, where her, her grandmother, uh, who was uh, a native of, of Norway, uh, where, where her grandmother lived. Uh, so there was lots, lots of uh, uh, lots of inter international background. So she she had that uh, kind of uh, uh, in influence on 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 me. Um, I should also say my interest in in democracy and in stability and and peace has to do with the fact uh, that I actually uh, experienced the Second World War. Uh, I was um, I was eight or eight and a half years old. Uh, during the last year of, of the war, which means uh, I was all, old enough uh, to remember the the events, and that was the, the the most fiercely fought part of the Second World World War, of course. Uh, and so, uh, you know what what war is, and what the, the fears are, and what all the the the, the damage is, and the human human toll. Uh, was uh, uh, brought brought home home to me, and uh, 
those memories, uh, of course, long ago, but they have stayed a part of my life. And of course, you did, as you said, grow up in the Netherlands, but you've lived and worked in the United States most of your adult life. How is having one foot on either side of the Atlantic shaped how you view the world? Uh, I think that also had its, its influence. Um, I have been back back and forth a great uh, a great deal from the Netherlands to the United States to go to college and graduate school. Then I was back in the Netherlands for uh, for research on my dissertation. Uh, then I taught in the in the United States again. Uh, well, I guess at age thirty two, uh, I I became a professor at the University of Leiden and I stayed there for ten years. Then I moved back to California, then to, to San Diego, which is in, in fact, of course, in Southern California. Uh, and um, so all, all of that, I've, I've traveled a great deal to conferences all, all over the world, met lots of, lots of people. All of that um, uh, obviously had, had its influence on me. And of course, the bulk of your research is about divided societies. What about that is it that really intrigues you? I started out uh, when I was uh, in, in graduate school at, at Yale University, when it was time to work on my dissertation. Uh, I, uh, I was anxious after having been in the United States for several years uh, to return to the, to the Netherlands, at least for a, a short uh, while, well, even though I didn't know yet uh, how long that was going to be, uh, and uh, I, I chose as my my topic the main uh, topic which has faded from uh, memory in 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 the Netherlands, namely the problem of um, uh, West New Guinea, Netherlands New Guinea, uh, which was then uh, challenged by by in Indonesia, and I. Uh, I was interested in uh, kind of as, a, as, a, as an odd case because, you know, why did the Netherlands uh, want to uh, re retain sovereignty over that one part of, uh, of, 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 of Indonesia? Um, and uh, the, the, that actually taught me it was not, not, some, not a line that I have followed la later on, uh, but the one thing that struck me there was that uh, uh, a lot of what happened in, in Dutch uh, government decision making seemed to be uh, irrational, didn't make, didn't make much sense. So how to explain that? And then it also struck me that that was really different because most of the time uh, uh, politics in the Netherlands was uh, was 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 uh, sedate. My oh my um, uh, uh, my dissertation supervisor, my promoter in Dutch, uh, was Gabriel Armand, and uh, he had written also about uh, the division in societies and had emphasized that uh, democracy was just very difficult to maintain in divided societies. And I saw in the Netherlands a, a, a divided society. I, I grew up in my uh, the, the, the small town that I mentioned here that was uh, very much a, uh, um, uh, there was a lot of verzuiling. <laughs> or pillarization, division in in that uh, in that village, uh, with um, ob obviously pol political uh, the division uh, between the you know moderate Protestants and non-believers on the one hand, and uh, the you know, the um, uh, the strong. Uh, uh, Protestant Calvinist uh, believers, on the other hand, and, and, and the town was pretty much split uh, down the down the middle, and then it had all of the usual things: people, you know, buying their bread from their uh, from somebody in their own uh, little uh, little little club. Uh, marching bands were great. There were two 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 different marching bands, and so on. I don't have to tell you much more about how uh, for Zeiling, uh, was uh, and so in in the, the Netherlands was was an, an, an example of a divided, uh, verzuild uh, gemeenschap uh, society, 
and uh, so then the explanation was why why was it still why did its government still still work and in in brief my explanation was uh, the, you could have a divided society but at the at the elite level if, if there is a cooperation understanding basically of the the problems of the division uh, then they can uh, then they can solve it so and really that came... is, sorry professor uh, Lightbright, if i can just cut you there that is consociationalism correct yes that is yes. Uh, so. I did not use that word in my early early writings, uh, but um, uh, I, 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 I called my in in English the title of my book on the Netherlands: the politics of of accommodation and compromise. And then my my uh, uh, my critics were to say, well, compromise is part of any kind of politics. So I really needed needed a, a specific term uh, to 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 describe what what i had in mind and that was consociation not something that i pulled out of the hat it also goes goes back to uh, a, 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 a partly german partly dutch thinker althusius uh, who talked about consociatio so i i, I borrowed that uh, term it's uh, uh, I, I found uh, I don't find consociational difficult term to pronounce, but people have complained about that. And so I also talk about power sharing. Okay. Well, I think the incredible thing about consociationalism is that it has been put into practice in so many parts of the world since we first started writing about it. Um, but we see different types in practice. So we see a liberal model and a corporate model of consociationalism. A uh, liberal model is one where voters can decide by themselves um, the extent of their participation, whereas in a corporate model that is predetermined based on religious and ethnic groups. Um, and in Bosnia and Herzegovina, a case that is frequently referenced in the literature, uh, we see an example of corporate consociationalism. So we wanted to ask you, in these kind of cases, where power sharing is uh, predetermined based on ethnic groups or religious groups, do we risk entrenching or reinforcing sectarian divisions? Yes, I think that is a, a problem. One of the interesting things about when you look at the, uh, the different forms uh, of, of power sharing is that it, it, it's it's different in there's there there are so many differences between uh, the, the different systems. Um, my my preference. And that is what I have rec recommended when I've, I've talked with uh, uh, with decision makers in dif different countries is to uh, have this uh, uh, self self determined uh, kind of um, uh, consociation, and that is uh, ba basically, of course, what uh, what what the Netherlands had with proportional representation, and people can 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 choose which which party they support and then the party leaders make their uh, their compromise that is also the the, the form that uh, i think very wisely the south africans uh, chose uh, when they made their new constitution which was originally just a, a temporary con constitution in 1994 uh, that was also just based on on proportional representation and then rules for having power sharing in the in 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 in, in the cabinet uh, but different uh, countries have found the different things working the best for them um, uh, e even though I, I you know my my advice is all different i remember talking uh, with uh, legislators in in Beirut in Lebanon in 1984, that was actually right in the middle of the of the civil war uh, there. Uh, I had a, a meet meeting with uh, with legislators, and I I, I made my uh, uh, my recommendation for this self self determined type of power sharing. Said, you know, why don't you just base it on proportional representation, not predetermined? Uh, you know, Mar Maronite, uh, Shiite, uh, Sunni uh, groups, uh, but uh, uh, the 
they, they, I guess they, 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 they did make some adjustments in their system, but that did not uh, go go over to a completely self-determined uh, system. But my my recommendation, to, uh, first of all, for divided society is yes, you need power sharing. It's it's an it's a necessary condition, not a sufficient condition for success. <clears throat> and then, uh, the, as far as the form of power sharing is concerned, it's the, the, the kind that you mentioned, I, I think, tends to work best. Professor Leithart, have you been consulted frequently um, about your recommendations after you've published on consociationalism? Yes, mo most of the time it has been uh, kind of in indirect, that is to say, uh, it would be kind of talking with uh, uh, think tanks uh, who, who who then channel their their advice to the uh, to to the to the, to the government in South Africa. It was also uh, in indirect in that I never made a uh, specific recommendation or was asked for a specific, specific recommendation by the government before uh, 1994. So that was still the apartheid uh, government. But I served in an advisory uh, commission that was uh, chaired by, no, not chaired by, but was instituted uh, by, uh, uh, by Butulesi. Uh, the, 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 the chief um, politician in KwaZulu. Uh, and so that, that way, the, that recommendation went to the government. And I spoke uh, kind of more in, informally with, with many members of the, of the cabinet and many uh, legislators. Uh, and uh, uh, typ typically in South Africa, what, what they would tell me is they would be always be very very polite and say thank you professor we appreciate your uh, your coming to the country and and giving us the idea of power sharing but but but, but we think it's risky and then I would say well you think it's risky because you have the uh, you think you have the choice between maintaining exclusive white power and sharing power but I I, I said in in the in the long run. Uh, the choice that is not your choice. The choice is be between sharing power and losing power. And so, if if that is the choice, doesn't power sharing m make more sense to you? A lot of these agreements you you mentioned about being consulted in Lebanon during the civil war there, the Taif agreement that ended the war there, the Dayton agreement that ended the conflict in Bosnia and Herzegovina, the Good Friday agreement in Northern Ireland. A lot of these were largely externally engineered. And I think a lot of scholars increasingly link contemporary democratic deficits to institutions that were imposed as part of these agreements. Do you think more attention ought to be paid to this sort of international involvement? Uh, and if we were able to do that, if, that there would be a more democratically responsive framework? Yes, I think uh, that would be. I think it has uh, actually already uh, happened. Uh, the, 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 the various agencies of the United Nations have been in, involved, and uh, typically the, the main ad ad advice used to be uh, kind of along the lines of uh, uh, American or British democracy works, works, works best. And I think that is no longer the case. Uh, for instance, when um, uh, uh, government a new constitution had to be formed for Iraq, uh, then uh, the uh, United Nations ex experts uh, and, the, and, and the people that were in, involved, and I guess I was not involved at, at all with Iraq, but kind of a, a younger generation, uh, Brendan O'Leary and uh, John McGarry, uh, they were they were in, in, involved in in that, and I think uh, power sharing from an, an originally an outlier has has become uh, the, the the kind of uh, main uh, re recommendation that is that, that is being followed. But does this distribution of power among predetermined groups, say in the case of Bosnia, Croats, Serbs, Bosniaks? not inevitably lead to the disenfranchisement of particular minority groups that are not explicitly mentioned in this power sharing uh, arrangement? Yeah, I think that is uh, 
that that is a problem um and uh, for, so again for that that reason i think it is better to have a self-determined uh system and the the the, the, the two basic constitutional uh, prescriptions that I come to again and again is uh, you know c countries uh, really almost all all countries regardless of how divided they are I think they're best off having an electoral system which is a, a, a form of proportional representation and then in the choice between presidential and parliamentary government I think parliamentary government works work works best I mean we have, I've also written written about the the problems of presidential government I'm I'm certainly not the originator of of, of that Juan Linz was the uh, the, the 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 main uh, uh, the the, the main political scientist who developed this uh, this argument and looked into the the dangers of of presidentialism but in any case uh, combination of proportional representation and a parliamentary form of government uh, i am convinced uh, tends to work best so professor Leithart, i'll be back to the point of electoral systems in a minute but um just going back to external engineering, um, external involvement in power sharing agreements. Uh, we see a lot of work in political science about the EU's interests in maintaining democratic stability in um, Central and Eastern Europe, and in, including cases like Bosnia. And a lot of that uh, research, a lot of that work paints it as a trade-off where uh, the interest privileging democratic stability comes at the cost of democratic uh, quality. Do you see it the same way? Do you think that there is a risk of a trade-off in the region and um, how concerned do you think we should be about this? Yeah, I guess the the um... Uh, I'm 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 not not sure how this uh, uh, applies to uh, Central and Eastern uh, Eastern Europe, but the um, uh, the conventional wisdom at the time that I was uh, uh, a student in college and also in in graduate school was that. Uh, if, if the, 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 the choice between a, a British-style majoritarian uh, democracy and, let's say, a Dutch-style or, or a Swedish-style or a Swiss-style uh, power-sharing democracy with proportional representation and so on, was that, yes, uh, <clears throat> that uh, uh, proportional representation uh, would be would lead to a better democratic quality, but it comes at the expense of uh, of political stability and and po political <coughs> effectiveness effectiveness of government uh, uh, policy. And I think that again was uh, the conventional wisdom was not really correct. Uh, I think as far as quality is concerned, yes, uh, but the democratic stability, I guess in my my uh, my last book, the second edition of Patterns of Democracy, uh, I, 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 I showed pretty conclu conclusively that all along the line, both in terms of stability, effectiveness, but also, also democratic quality, the um, uh, consensus democracies, which are typ typically uh, the, the, defi defined or in, in, in terms of uh, proportional representation, parliamentary government, and you know the sharing of power, they work work, work best not only uh, and in, including in the effectiveness of, 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 of government. I think what you have in, in Eastern Europe is that uh, the p p power has been uh, sub sub subverted uh, to, uh, the leaders who are establishing uh, basically uh, uh, only par partially democratic systems uh, and are move moving toward uh, autocracy. And of course, that can, can happen in, in any kind of uh, system. In the case of Hungary, it also uh, was caused by manipulation of the electoral, electoral system. And... Um, I think it's like I actually applaud the efforts of the European Union uh, to kind of say we 
we maintain democracy within within the European Union and we we, we try to discourage autocracy. Okay. Uh, thank you, Professor Leipert. I think we've had a pretty wide-ranging discussion already. Um, we've moved from your work on consociationalism to consensus and majoritarian democracies. Before we go a little bit more in depth on these political systems, um, can you just summarize for us then what the main difference is between consensus democracies and majoritarian democracies? So, so do we understand correctly that on one hand you have a set of institutions such as proportional representation that move together with consensus democracies and on the other hand you have um, a majorita majoritarian democracies that include among other sets of institutions the, the presidential system, is that correct? Yes, uh, the I mean I have not uh, uh, in in my my, my studies I I um, this, the, you know I I I have found that presidential <coughs> systems do not work very well, but they're actually among the stable democracies there are very few presidential systems, uh, which which is one. Uh, one uh, indication of the, the the problem that you have with uh, with with presidential uh, systems, but basically, <coughs> you know, you can you can see the difference between majoritarian and consensus democracy by uh, by uh, comparing, say, the British system with, uh, with Switzerland, and I, I do that in in patterns of democracy. Uh, I, I, I kind of outline the typical. Uh, aspects of uh, majoritarian democracy, and uh, then uh, with you know with a Switzerland Switzerland as an example of consensus democracy, and it goes along the lines of uh, if you if you start thinking about what what are the best institutions to concentrate power. Uh, in in the hands of relatively few people or even in one 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 person uh, then it is uh, a majoritarian electoral system it is a, a one party uh, one party system it is a system in in which uh, the relations be, between cabinet and parliament uh, are, are are go all the way in favor of the of the cabinet and a relatively uh, <coughs> powerless legislature uh, uh, similarly but you in, in the interest group system do you have a, a, a system in which is kind of a free for all uh, of different interest groups com competing with each other uh, with the more cooperative systems where they are uh, it's often called cor corporatism uh, or neo corporatism where these uh, 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 groups are uh, you know the the their their aims are uh, co coordinated and so if that is one side of the the the, the ledger then the, the contrast is with <coughs> a system in which you have um, more uh, not not uh, just executive su su supremacy uh, and, and where you have a multi-party system and coalition government and and, and 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 so on. So it really starts with the kind of lo logical thinking of you know how do you concentrate power rather and how you uh, how you share. Uh, power and the things that I've mentioned now I uh, also call you know the the, of the first dimension uh, of the the contrast between majoritarian and consensus government. There is a second dimension which has to do with uh, unitary government versus federal government, centralized government versus decentralized government. Uh, very easy to to amend the constitution, very more constitutional rigidity, and and so on. I think that's an important contrast too, but it doesn't seem to have much influence for for, for policy. So, with regard to policy recommendations, I usually uh, always say it's the the the, the first dimension uh, that is uh, that is crucial. As we see here in the Netherlands, voters have recently chosen, recently, a few months ago, chosen for a right-wing direction in 
uh, their country. After a long coalition formation process, a Dick Show, a bureaucrat, was chosen as prime minister candidate. To what extent is this appointment of a bureaucrat to this position, as opposed to the brash populace leading the leading party, a reflection of these institutional structures? Yeah, well, I think uh, uh, the the appointment of uh, kind of a uh, you know, top civil servant rather than a polit politician uh, has its precedence in in the in the Netherlands and used used in other countries as as well. Then often to uh, <coughs> deal with uh, crises that are not not easily uh, solved otherwise. I think with regard to these uh, extremist uh, uh, groups, I have um, I'm, I'm often asked, and I don't really have a good answer for that. What is the reason why they have come up in so many, uh, so many countries? Um, I think probably it mainly has to do with the contrast between the the old rural urban. A, a contrast that uh, Stan Rockan, the famous uh, Norwegian sociologist, uh, talked about a great, a great deal, and uh, feeling that the uh, you know urban elites, uh, urban uh, politicians are really elites, and they're not paying attention to the uh, the common people, and 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 so on. But then the question is, you know, how do you how do you deal with uh, with that? And I, I I think the best way is to try to involve even these uh, far uh, left or right uh, uh, groups into the uh, government. I think that is the the, the best way uh, to uh, as, as long as they they do not form the government by by themselves. Uh, and that is the problem, of course, in the United States. If the far right here <coughs> and and Trump wins, he has exclusive power. But if you have a coalition uh, with the more moderate moderate parties, I think that is the best way to uh, perhaps I'm not to use the right word, but to to kind of tame uh, the, uh, uh, the 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 far. Uh, right or, or or left politicians take them into the government and see see what they can uh, see what see what they can 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 do. Uh, they would have to moderate their 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 demands better than I think just uh, excluding them all all uh, together. I guess in in Belgium that is called the cordon sanitaire uh, to to keep the the extremes out. Uh, I think it's better to try to uh, include them. I think if you just uh, keep, keep keep them out, they 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 will just uh, keep uh, increasing their support. I guess that's a very uh, relevant statement right now. That's a big debate that's going on in our department here as well. I think. Um, I think we'll move on to some more questions about the Netherlands. Yeah. Of course, you're familiar with the Bolton model, the Dutch uh, version of consensus-based economic and social policy making from the 80s and 90s. It's often held up an, as an ideal of consensus uh, democracy. But, and, and Dutch people often pride themselves on being pragmatic deal makers, but we're curious on how, to what extent, that's a result of political culture, or rather a result of these uh, institutions. How does culture and institutions interact with each other in this respect? I think they, you know, culture, it's an old debate in political science. I, I think they they tend to uh, in, interact, that's to say, uh, a, a culture, a specific cultural uh, traits or developments can uh, uh, in influence uh, a structure uh, and changes in, in, in structure uh, can in influence uh, can influence culture. Uh, so uh, I think it's wrong to to think it's only a, a one way, uh, one way, uh, one 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 way de de development. Uh, <coughs> let me uh, just I, mean, I, have, I have a striking example of this where if you change this structure, it can also change a culture. I was in uh, in New Zealand. 
uh, two years after their move to from a, a British style majoritarian democracy uh, to uh, more of a, a power share, more consensus uh, type uh, democracy by by adopting proportional representation. And I I heard uh, I listened to um, an interview with the the prime minister of of New Zealand who was then a uh, I think that she was a member, the leader of the Conservative uh, Party, but was was uh, governing in a in a coalition, the first first coalition that uh, New, New Zealand had had ever had, and so her party was still in favour of trying to uh, get get rid of proportional representation and, and go back to uh, the oh, the old old system. But when when she was asked by the in, interviewer whether she supported that, she was saying, oh, no, you know, we, we should be really careful about uh, doing that. And she mentioned that as a result of proportional representation, there were more women representatives in the uh, New Zealand le legislature, uh, and uh, in including more women members in her own party. So she now had to also pr protect uh, the members of her own party, including the women members. So it, 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 here, I think, a change in the structure in New Zealand had had uh, uh, influenced uh, her to be more uh, to to be to, to be more in in favor of the uh, uh, of of the, the the system that had been adopted in in uh, in nineteen ninety six. Okay, well, Professor Leipart, um thank you for that. I think what we've been speaking a lot about theoretical work. Um, a lot of your scholarly contributions over the years. And quite a lot has happened um, in the world since you released your most recent revision even of Patterns of Democracies um, in 2012. And it looks to us that a pattern in throughout our conversation um, so far has been that contemporary democracies are experiencing new variants of divisions. Um, so we have what we now call pernicious polarization, where we have politicians engineering us versus them, divisions um, amongst voters, and voters are being focused on increasingly in political science research. Is there something fundamentally different in the divisions that we see today? And um, should we be approaching the study of these divisions as students and political scientists? differently than how you did um, back from the 1960s to 2012. <laughs> uh, well, I think I, I am probably uh, uh, too too old to uh, to to change my mind about uh, a lot a lot of these uh, uh, things. Uh, I think that many of these many of these de developments uh, should should be a research, and I think that is something for the. Uh, the the next uh, generation uh, to to do. I have been uh, retired for uh, a long long time, and uh, after the, you mentioned my 2012 uh, a book, which was a sec second edition, but really uh, you know I had to re redo the and the entire book for that uh, edition. Then I had um, uh, one more multi-authored. A book which is about the, the United States in comparative pers 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 perspective, but that is uh, uh, those were my most recent. But already ten years ago, when time time flies, and uh, so um, uh, I I I I don't have really specific recommendations for uh, for, for dealing with or doing research. Uh, on the, the most recent developments, except that um, I, I stick with the idea that one should do empirical research rather than uh, uh, typically kind of rational choice type of, of uh, uh, thinking, which is 
which is still still of course useful for developing hypotheses, uh, but then those hypotheses need to be uh, need to be tested. I think there is also an overemphasis in contemporary political science on political methods, so that even uh, in my um, uh, the university that I was that I was associated with for the long, longest time with the University of California in San Diego, <clears throat> one of the fields of political science, in addition to comparative politics, American politics, international relations, and so on, the traditional field, there is now a field of political methodology. I mean, that is a whole, whole, whole field. And I, th I think for uh, for the the most efficient uh, and useful re research, we should not stare ourselves blind on more and more sophisticated methods. I think the we, we should st still do the, the the basic kind of field work and em empirical uh, empirical research. And uh, there are new, there are obviously new problems, uh, but uh, let let apart apart from giving this this kind of general advice, I think the the the, the new generation, the younger generation, should take over and take responsibility for uh, for this uh, this kind of re research. Considering these differences that you mentioned, do you think the institutional patterns? And the behaviors you identify uh, during the career still hold for the sorts of divisions we see today? Um, I th I think probably uh, probably yes. Um, probably, perhaps my my critics might might say that I am so strongly identified with the uh, idea that consensus democracy uh, works uh, works works best <coughs> that I can just cannot see beyond that. But I would think if for a, you know for a long time now, uh, and you know by, in my uh, comparative research, I look at look at uh, really the the situation since 1945. Uh, so it's been uh, not quite a, quite a century, of of course. Uh, but on the on the whole, uh, the consensus democracy has been the the best way to solve. Of uh, problems, and so I, I, I think consensus democracy is most likely to deal most the most in the most effective way with the new problems that uh, come come around uh, uh, too. Uh, but it's uh, I, I guess what what I would like is uh, to uh, people to you know do the this, the same kind of. Re research on on this on a, a relatively large number of of countries uh, that are comparable, where you can uh, qu quantify the var variables and then use uh, statistics uh, to to look for uh, for relationships and hopefully uh, statistically significant relationships uh, that can be can be identified. Thank you, Professor Neipart. I think um, we'll take some 10 minutes for audience questions now, if that's all right with you. If you have an audience here that's been um, listening for the past 40, 50 minutes, and I'm sure they have a couple of questions on their mind. Um, do we, do we want to start over here? Uh, hello, Professor Leipart. Thank you for your words so far. Uh, my question is more, uh, given your research in divided states, I wanted to get your uh, opinion on the implications of the recent Indian elections on minority representation in India itself. Yes, <laughs> India is a, a, a most interesting case, of course, of 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 democracy of. When I was uh, again, when I was just a, a, a student, the idea was that in the so-called third world, uh, democracy could not take take hold, uh, and uh, India was always the prime prime example of where democracy did work, and. Uh, uh, 
perhaps surprisingly, in such a big country and and a country with so 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 many differences. And I think the an the answer uh, to um, the question of why why democracy uh, worked so well in India was that in fact it was a power sharing democracy. When you looked superficially at India, it didn't look like that uh, because one party was in control. That was the Congress party. But the Congress party was, an, in, in fact, a kind of a, a consociational party, uh, the, 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 uniting with the ver various minorities and where, in, in particular, Muslims uh, did, did, did have representation and, and uh, did, did have uh, influence. I, I, I visited uh, India for an extended uh, period of research in the early or mid mid 1990s, and uh, uh, was then I think it became clear that uh, un unless in 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 the, the Congress would be would be careful that there would be a, a great danger that the BJP the uh, the, the Hindu Nationalist Party uh, would would gain gain power and would un, undo the power sharing features that India had uh, be before, uh, and uh, my my idea was uh, that uh, if 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 India had adopted proportional representation, this would not have happened uh, because. Uh, then the BJP would have remained a, a min minority party, and they would have uh, uh, not not been in uh, in such a dominant position. In fact, uh, the the first big uh, election victory by by Modi uh, was uh, was was kind of engineered by their system of uh, majoritarian voting. I think the first big victory of the BJP, they only won something like 37% of the of, of the vote. But then they have that um, kind of consolidated their 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 power. So I've been very concerned about uh, about India and I think uh, the what the BJP and Modi have been doing I think is a danger uh, for uh, India. And so the the result of the most recent election I think is a, a kind of a, a, a tiny step in the uh, in tiny step back backwards uh and uh, so that the bgp no longer all by itself uh has the power in 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 india but i am i'm looking at at india with a considerable concern perhaps another question gentlemen in the yellow sweatshirt uh yeah first of all thank you as well um Correct me if I understood you incorrectly, but earlier uh, you suggested, I think, to take far right, for example, into the government to unmask them um, or so. And I'm wondering, isn't that a very risky step to take? Um, I don't know, for example, in Germany, I mean, maybe that's also historically a special case, um, but I cannot imagine any scenario in which that would lead to a state of democracy that would be beneficial, um, even though those debates are also going on in Germany, especially uh, among the conservatives. And also looking to Austria, where they did that, for example, um, I cannot see that there was any benefit from it. So um, isn't the risk a bit too high? And maybe you can just elaborate a bit on your thoughts about that. Yeah, I, th I think it's a question of uh, the different risks uh, that you you take yes there is a, a risk in uh, allowing uh, far far right and basically uh, parties that, that that are not friendly to the democracy in into the uh, into the government but by excluding them I, th I think they will gain even even more more support and it's better to uh, to to get them into government together with with other uh, parties who then can keep a lid on the more more ex extreme uh, measures. Obviously, these far right parties, uh, when they're in coalition, cannot get their entire program uh, ac ac accepted. Um, 
but uh, you, you know, it's all, there's all, always a, a, a danger. You're talking about contemporary Germany. I'm also thinking uh, far back, to, uh, almost a hundred years ago, uh, to the Weimar Republic in in in, in Germany. The uh, uh, the Nazi Party never won a majority in a democratic uh, e election, uh, but but somehow by was uh, you know Hitler did did come to power because he was uh, appointed by the uh, by the by the president, and then uh, be, because the Nazi Party was just such a dominant party, he managed to uh, dismantle. Um, dismantle what uh, the the Weimar democracy uh, that had uh, that had existed. Uh, so there, there there's that that uh, that kind of danger. But of course, by that by that by that time, you know, the 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 Nazi Party did get more than forty percent of the vote. It was uh, it it was a, a, a huge a party al al already. I don't think we're we're talking about that in the, in Germany now or in the in in the Netherlands uh, now. Uh, as long as they're they are in a in a coalition with more moderate uh, politicians uh, then i think the uh, the danger is not that that great <laughs> and in fact i think the 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 good thing is that if they are not able to get much of their program adopted they 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 will lose support among the electorate who 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 want uh, you know ab absolute uh, uh, obedience from their uh, their 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 leaders. But um, I I agree that there is a, a risk. So it's a, a question of weighing the different kinds of risks. Just to push back on that point a little, in the Netherlands, of course, the PKP is thirty five, I believe, seats uh, in the last election. Isn't it then? And, and there, a lot of their policies will be carried out by the incoming government. May, perhaps some of, not the, the most hot button issues, but certainly the more commonly accepted by the other parties in the coalition, this is quite a drastic step for a democracy to take, is it not? Yeah, I think it is a, a drastic step, and it's <laughs> certainly not uh, typical of the, the Dutch politics that I have been uh, familiar with over many de de decades of, of my, uh, my, my, my life. Um, so, you know, but, well, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a drastic step, but uh, <clears throat> Is it imaginable that you would find a, could have a coalition of all of the other or most of the other parties and ex exclude the um, uh, builders and his 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 party? Uh, that is al also a, a, a possi possibility. But I I think then there 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 may just be. Uh, it, it will, it'll, it'll, in fact, only help Wilders. I think somebody like like Wilders, uh, I think, works best as an uh, as an op opposition politician, and uh, will probably not function that that well being in in the government. I don't know whether uh, it's such a recent development, and I have I haven't found out yet. <laughs> whether uh, Wilders himself, I think, will not be in the in the government. He will uh, be, be, be remain in parliament as the leader of his as his his party. But it's not uh, certainly not something that I say. Hey, this is not this is not a problem. Uh, I th I think it is a problem, and uh, you know the, the the question is how how best to deal with it and how to weigh the risks of different courses of action. I think uh, this is a fantastic point to end on. I think weighing all the courses of action that lay before us, I think discussing how we uh, come to democratic conclusions is incredibly important. So I want to thank you, Professor Leipart, for your time today. Apologize for the technical difficulties in the beginning of the interview. It's been a fascinating conversation about all things democracy. And for those of you who still haven't enough, have had enough of us, join us on the 20th of June for a chat with Herr Jan Severs, the former leader of the Christie Union, right here in the E-Hall. 
Ladies and gentlemen, thank you all. You've been a superb audience. Good night. Thank you.